speakers for today's talk. Um, briefly, so um, we'll start with talking about even what is pain in this nociceptive pathway. Um, we'll talk, discuss how the opioids actually work um, and then tolerance and hypersensitivity along with some um, complications and alternative treatment methods. Um, so uh, why is this important to us? Um, chronic pain, it's a huge problem. Um, it's a major health issue across the world, which you know is intuitive, but uh, it affects approximately one third of the Western population. So it's huge. Um, another study showing that chronic pain, specifically post-surgical pain, can affect up to 50% of these patients across the world. So that's a huge number. Um, and this is costing us 600 billion US dollars annually. Um, this is another study in the Lancet in 2019, um, which really kind of helped um, start this uh, project for me, but it is uh, showing the importance of us as surgeons and our prescribers at the beginning of surgery. So this is where a lot of our patients' problems start. Um, in the USA, it's, this paper highlighted um, up to 75% of patients are receiving opioid prescriptions upon discharge, um, whether it's you know minor surgery, major surgery, but that is a number that continues to increase despite what we know about opioid use. Um, and it also increases their risk of misuse and problems down the road every time you repeat that prescription after discharge. So up to 44% every time they call and ask for more and we do it. Um, you're increasing their chance of um, having a long-term issue by um, almost double. So um, challenges when we treat patients with opioid um, use disorder is um, associated with longer outcome, excuse me, longer length of stay, um, higher readmission rates, um, higher risk of morbidity and mortality, and this issue uh, with the undiagnosed opioid hypersensitivity. Um, so what type of pain um, are we going to focus on today is the nociceptive pain pathway, um, but broadly three different types of pain. Um, so nociceptive pain is your protective adaptive response to pain and it's directly in response to a stimuli. So um, your surgical pain, pain from um, cutting the skin is following this pathway. Um, the nociceptive fibers, two distinct ones are your alpha delta fibers and your C fibers. Um, so alpha delta, that's your uh, myelinated, fast, sharp, localized pain. Um, and your C fibers are your unmyelinated, so it's a slower transduction, it's poorly localized, and it's more of your burning, throbbing type pain. So what actually happens when you um, cut the skin or when you have an injury? Um, this picture here shows a hammer to the hand, you know, similar method, mechanism. Um, you actually have localized cell lysis, so you're releasing a lot of intracellular inflammatory substances, and you're also inducing the production of new inflammatory substances at that injury site. Um, so arachidonic acid, that's a big one that we are all familiar with, but um, this is released when the phospholipid cell membranes are actually um, destroyed, um, and it's headed down the metabolism pathway for the COX-2 um, and COX-1, so you're producing prostaglandins with this. Um, histamine is a um, localized inflammatory substance. It is produced via the mast cells at the site of injury, um, and this also serves to activate the localized nociceptors. Um, and they produce neuropeptides such as substance P, um, which we'll discuss more throughout this talk. Um, globulins and protein kinases, uh, this is our, excuse me, these are intracellular enzymes. So these are um, then released into the I mean, extracellular world and they cause damage and they stimulate the nociceptive fibers. Nerve growth factor, um, these are selective um, activators of receptors on these nociceptive neurons. Um, and they serve to um, not only activate them, but they are shown to prevent apoptosis of these specific sensory neurons. So all of these things, um, just collectively nociceptive stimuli, um, they activate the transient receptor potential channels on these free nerve endings, um, and they cause uh, depolarization and firing of these first order neurons. These signals are then transduced to these second order neurons in the dorsal horn and the spinal cord. Um, those alpha delta fibers uh, release glutamate onto the second order neurons, whereas the C fibers release substance P. Um, and the second order neurons are what take this signal up to the brain via the spinothalamic tract. So what do our immune receptors do for us in the absence of drugs? Um, they are activated by your encephalins and your endorphins, so your happiest hormones. So, um, these are produced in your pituitary gland and your hypothalamus, and they're released when your body experiences stress or pain. Um, this is an extremely, you know, advantageous um, response for our body. You know, evolutionarily, it makes sense, um, and this can be seen, you know, highest during the mouth in labor and childbirth. So, um, your body is trying to protect you. It's been doing this since the dawn of time. Um, so, these receptors have a role, whether you know you're using um, exogenous opioids or not. So, how these opioids actually work? <clears throat> excuse me, 
um, stimulation of the mu receptors. Um, so they activate a um, inhibitory G protein receptor. Um, these are on the presynaptic ends of those nociceptive neurons actually at the skin level. Um, opioid binding activates this subunit that then um, works to inhibit the entire process. So your goal is to decrease um, cyclic AMP and overall decrease neuroexcitability. And that's where you get the analgesia component. Um, in the CNS, the way this works is decreasing your presynaptic release of GABA. Um, and now you're disinhibiting your dopaminergic neurons. Um, so that's where you get the euphoria or the reward response. Um, and those are the two main goals um, of the opioid use. So specifically, um, tolerance and opioid-induced hypersensitivity are, are big issues with using these drugs. Um, tolerance is the increased amount of drug needed to induce the same effect over a prolonged exposure, whereas um, opioid-induced hypersensitivity or hyperalgesia is a um, paradoxical increase in pain seen. Um, it can be either in the acute or prolonged setting. Um, there's several factors involved in tolerance, um, and it's extremely variable um, per patient. So it, it is difficult to study, but two main ways patients you know, develop tolerance. The associative tolerance is um, classical conditioning, you know, Pavlov's dog. Um, you take the neutral stimulus and you pair it with the unconditioned stimulus. Um, so you're eliciting a desired response now. Um, and then the pharmacological tolerance um, is more common and can be explained with changes in pharmacokinetics. So um, the dose response curve seen here is shifted to the right. Uh, you need more of the drug to induce the same effects. Um, and these are associated with your uh, neural adaptations or plasticity, which we'll discuss. So um, neuroplasticity, this concept um, represents the extensive changes that occur to the neurons um, after prolonged exposure to inflammatory mediators and cytokines. Um, their peripheral terminals become sensitive, their axons become you know, hyper excitable, um, so much so that they can actually produce their own spontaneous action potentials. Um, so they're firing now um, on their own without having that direct you know, noxious stimuli. Um, when this process occurs in the brain, it's uh, in the spinal cord, it's called central sensitization. Um, so the neurons and the non-neuronal cells actually are shown to undergo structural reorganization. Um, and this is responsible for um, decreased pain thresholds, you know, for the nerve firing and also an increased pain, um, perceived pain duration and amplitude. So they're experiencing a much, you know, higher level of pain than previous. Um, important just to understand the rest of the talk, you know, go back to the beginning, you know, we talked about needing to know the biochem in the last talk, but um, the G protein coupled receptors, there are three main subunits in each one, the alpha, beta, and gamma. Um, and then further from there, your three different subunits um, of the alphas. So your um, GS, so your stimulatory one, those are the ones that increase your cyclic AMP. Um, your inhibitory one, which we've already discussed, the main one that's the target of morphine or opiates. Um, and then your, um, there's a GQ, but that one is not as important for today. Um, so when you um, are actually seeing the um, attachment of the um, opioid to the receptor, you activate BGI and it dissociates from the, um, the G alpha I and it dissociates from the gamma beta complex. And you see this on the bottom right here that the gamma beta is what is activating the um, calcium channels. So all of these together are all contributing to the um, excitability of the neuron and the firing of action potentials. So what are we actually seeing on a um, intracellular level when their patients are developing tolerance? Um, like we already said, the acute opioid setting that decreases like the AMP, your goal is to decrease uh, neuronal firing. Um, but chronic opioid use, this is actually the opposite. It starts to upregulate the cyclic AMP. Um, it is a compensatory um, intracellular um, switch. So your body actually stops filling the GI subunits and it starts attaching itself to the GS. So it's changes down the line, it's trying to increase, it's, it's tired of being suppressed and then it starts to flip and now it's excitatory. Um, and you see this here um, again with the uh, far right is the activation of the um, GI, your downstream signaling is, is delayed. So that is your analgesic effect. Whereas in the tolerance, um, you're starting to get more activation. So this cycle continues um, and the um, continued firing of the GS also simulates a um, neuropeptide called a beta arrestin. This is shown to um, flag these receptors for what we call recycling. So it actually internalizes them within the cell. It you know, restructures them and spits them back out to the membrane. That is just saying that you're ready for more. So this is why you've got turnover of these receptors. They need more and more drug. And this is why you, you need more to achieve the same effect as you did at the very beginning.
the opioid induced hyperalgesia or hypersensitivity. Um, this is where intracellular signaling um, ignited by the mu opioid receptors are um, activated, leading to pro inflammatory cytokine release downstream. Um, so, similar pathway, you're getting you know, increased um, adenyl cyclase, increased protein kinase. You're overall increasing the neuron activity here. Um, you're activating your NTMA receptors and you are down regulating your glutamate receptors. Um, and overall, this um, change in the um, neurochloride homeostasis is what is causing these neurons to essentially flip. They were inhibitory, now they're excitatory, and you're seeing these adverse effects. So um, what we see in these patients are, again, the hyperalgesic response, what was first causing them pain relief, so the opioids were helping. Now it's the opposite, it's the opioids that are inducing pain. Um, you also will see pain at injury-free zones, so no longer pain just at their surgical site, but they're going to complain of pains everywhere. Um, also, you're going to see these withdrawal symptoms with some of the same, you know, muscle aches, um, things are associated with withdrawal, but you'll also see the, um, you know, the um, sweating, the diarrhea, anxiety, things associated with we see in other patients going through opioid withdrawal. Um, so overall, important to note the difference as the um, prescriber when patients call and they're continuing to have pain. We, is it tolerance or is it um, a hypersensitivity reaction? Because we um, treat them differently. If it's tolerance, you increase the dose and then you, you know, figure out how to treat it later down the line. But if it's this, the treatment, only treatment is to stop the opioids because that's actually causing them the pain. Um, so um, substances that are involved in this process um, specifically, um, more and more studies are showing that opioids actually trigger the inflammatory pathway. Um, System, um, you're leading to production of these pain mediators and cytokines and things we discussed in the beginning um, down the line by using the drugs. Um, and repeated opioid administration is leading to activation of your glial cells in your midbrain, um, initiating this cascade of events throughout your body. Um, and this contributes to sensitization of the neurons and lowering the threshold for firing. So these TLR4 receptors, um, they are noted to be. Um, they're involved in the development of septic shock. That's kind of what they're known for in the biochem world. But for this purpose, they have been noted in um, spinal cord neurons after opioid treatments to be significantly upregulated. So they're associated with enhanced pain um, sensitization or nociception. Um, so when they are activated, they initiate um, an intracellular cascade that leads to um, increased transcription factors and upregulation of these pro-inflammatory cytokines. So when these are activated, they're actually inducing more cross-signaling formation, more free radicals, more of these inflammatory substances that we are well known. So um, not only is this a reason to not use the opioids or attempt to not use them because you're inducing more problems, this also highlights the importance of our multimodal pain regimen. So the insets we're using are treating pain for the patient at baseline, but we're also fighting the side effects of opioids. Um, substance P, it's an important, um, it's an important uh, neuropeptide that is discussed throughout um, this whole pathway. Um, it is produced by the afferent neurons, and it is the primary ligand for this um, neurokinin 1 receptor. Um, and these receptors are found to coexist with the opioid receptors throughout the body. Um, and significant uh, levels of these receptors are found in patient, not patient, rat patients, um, the rats that are morphine tolerant. So they're um, shown to be almost opposites of each other. Um, throughout these studies, which is interesting. So if you have one, you don't have the other and vice versa. Um, this study showed that if you knocked out the um, gene that actually codes for substance P in the rats, you can eliminate their response to intense pain completely, um, which was really interesting. So you can't have this intense pain um, reaction without this um, substance P and neurokinin 1 receptor. Um, so again, this further study down the line shows the mu opioid receptor activation actually directly inhibits substance P release. Um, and so essentially you can regain morphine efficacy if you block the neurokinin 1 receptors. Um, this is going to allude to using of this uh, MK1 receptor antagonist down the line um, when I talk about the other drugs. So how do we reduce opioid exposure to the patients? Um, Preoperative counseling is number one. There's, there's no substitute for um, just talking to the patients, preparing them for what's about to happen. Um, I've been you know, in the joints uh, rotation this last month, and I think they do a really good job of telling patients you know, what to expect. Um, you know, we talk about not using opioids, what they're going to get as a prescription after, so they're not in pain, and then you're not telling them then 
this is why we're not using opioids. Um, it's much more effective if you tell them before, we're going to focus on Tylenol, we're going to focus on, you know, um, there are other drugs and we're not going to use the opioids. Because um, avoiding that initial prescription is what we've got to work towards as a overall goal. Um, not so much just using them for a short period of time, but it needs to be avoiding the first one because that's where you see you can actually have those reactions starting from the very first dose. Um, you need to have your entire staff on boards so or anyone who calls or messages so you're not getting those repeated prescriptions and you're having, you know, a night in front. Um, and then we also need to know about the multimodal pain regimen. So we need to know about all these options and things we use to treat the patients um, so we get the best analgesic effect and can produce opioids. So alternative, um, this study was a really good one done for um, chronic pain patients, the cancer patients. Um, but I think for this study, it, it highlights um, importance of treating underlying conditions. So patients who are experiencing mood disorders or having you know, depression, um, specifically Cymbalta was included in this study, but if you treat their underlying mood disorder, they're gonna have decreased um, perceptions of pain in general. Um, and additionally, if they're not sleeping, you've got to address that. Um, if they um, are having a, um, that is seizure disorder or thought is to decrease the nerve excitability of the neurons that are generating pain. Um, so these anticonvulsives and sodium channel blockers are used there. Um, and dexamethasone, that's a good one um, that has been new in the literature, specifically the joints literature here. Um, this is a paper out in JOA this year. Um, Dr. Mesa was involved in this study um, showing that the single dose of intraoperative dexamethasone is proven to decrease post-op um, emesis in pain and also decreases post-op opioid intake. Um, there are further studies um, being shown that also introduce a oral steroid taper in the post-operative period. So that is something we can continue to focus on as physicians and continue to um, study as an alternative. If that is a safe, effective use and it does not increase their risk of infection, that is a great alternative. And as we alluded to before, the um, neurokinin receptor antagonist. So this is a drug that's already being used in the chemotherapy world. Um, due to the location of these receptors in the emesis centers of your brain. Um, but we can still um, use them in the um, drug world. If you're trying to prevent patients from having a morphine tolerance, you can use this drug um, and essentially re completely restore their morphine um, potency. And lastly, the uh, NDMA antagonist, so your ketamine, which is a drug that we're very used to um, in the, in the um, call world. But for this purpose, it, we are um, using it to prevent this hyperexcitability of the neurons themselves. So you are able to reduce the glutamate um, excitatory response, and you are preventing these neurons from being um, developing the hypersensitivity or the tolerance reaction. So overall, this is the importance of this is to really cover the, the biochemical pathways well. Um, it's important for surgeons to understand all these. I know this is a is a lot for some people. It's a lot for me. It's a lot of studying, but it's important that we are, are very serious about this and we understand how everything works so we can educate ourselves, we can educate our patients, and we can drive further studies to continue this, this pathway. Um, it's not just enough to say don't use opioids. We need to understand why and we need to be able to constrict uh, or construct new studies to continue to work this up. Um, and we also need to continue um, to educate ourselves on the multimodal pain regimen so we can um, best care for our patients. Um, and that is all I have for today. Thank you. Great talk, Landon. I, I thought we were done with pharmacology and biochemistry at the end of part one of the boards. I guess not. I guess we're never done with it. We're never done. Thank, thank you for um, putting this together. This is very comprehensive and very good. Um, so we're doing some non-opioid surgeries here, even big surgeries. I know Natty's written on that. Mm -hmm. Bo um, has been involved as well. What um, it would seem like for these piddly arthroscopies that I do, we probably shouldn't use opioids at all. What, what is your, um, what, how do you stratify the cases and what is your recommendation? I, I know you don't, don't need to get into the detail totally, but are there a certain half of our procedures or whatever that we should be aiming to not use opioid, opioids at all and some that we should or how, how do you process that? So I think the overall goal is, is correct is not use them at all. I think that would be a, a great goal. I think that is harder to achieve just due to well, patient expectation and just physician education. So if uh, you feel that you can provide the patients um, adequate analgesia just using you know, Tylenol and ibuprofen, that's something that you have to adopt 
on your own practice and you have to talk to them about it, you know, preoperatively and postoperatively just be prepared for that. I think it's absolutely doable. And I've seen it. I mean, these patients are getting total hips and knees and they're not necessarily using opioids and they don't ask for them. Um, in extreme cases, they do. They kind of have a couple on backup, but uh, they go into it knowing like, you know, I'm getting this you know, big incision and I'm going through this big surgery, but I'm only going to use Tylenol after. And it works. Like the patients are, are overall very satisfied. They recover really well. I think it's all about the preoperative counseling um, and what you are going to decide to adopt as your practice. So, yeah, I'll, I'll kind of follow on that. But, you know, there's, there's definitely a, 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 a gating phenomenon or a, there's a susceptibility that some people have to, to opioids. And I think it actually, uh, as a, a lot of the science indicates, it starts, for, it starts maybe even with that, that, that very first dose. I think the most important thing in my practice of the kind of clinical application of this is spending a lot of time talking to the patients ahead of time. <clears throat> There's importance in terms of timing of different medications, uh, just based on the pharmacokinetics of the, of, of the various medications. It takes uh, to get uh, blood levels of Tylenol um, that are effective. It's about 45 minutes after you've ingested, 45 minutes to an hour and a half. And so consequently, if you time that uh, before uh, giving any type of opioid, uh, an hour before uh, the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory or the Tylenol, your effect with the opioid, which is predominantly in the first sort of uh, bump of that, is that endorphin kick that you get uh, as a result. Your, your effectiveness goes up about 40 uh, to 60% in uh, various studies. So I tell people, so very simple, TIM, T-I-M, Tylenol, ice, and, and movement. And movement is helpful for them as well, but in, only after an hour are they to take any type of narcotic. I tell them, I give them, I give them you know, there's a psychological component to this as well. They want to know that, uh, that they have a rescue. And I'll give them uh, for the total needs. I don't put this on the dose, but for the total needs, I'll give them some oxy I'll give them you know, about 15 or 20 of them. I tell them, I don't want you to ever take it. This is a break the glass kind of moment. Do not take this. And you'd be surprised how often they'll come back in the office. I mean, I tell you, it's the majority of them never take it. Yeah, that, that's exactly what we found, too. You know, I, I was shocked, actually, by how quick opioid-induced hyperalgesia can set up. And I think probably the smartest thing we did when we designed our opioid-free pathway is we, we did not have patients receive any opioids in the perioperative period at all. Uh, and I didn't think it was a big deal at the time, but it turned out that was probably the, 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 probably the most important component of our opioid-free pathway is they didn't receive opioids at the time of their nerve block, during their surgery, in the recovery room, because that's where it hits them. And then if they've already had slugs of opioids then, cat's out of the bag. By the time they get home, they're already going to have that down regulation of their endogenous opioids. And so they're going to rely on exogenous opioids and then they go down this cascade. And that's where when we looked at pain scores 24 hours after surgery, we had a paradoxical higher level of pain in the opioid group than we did the opioid free group. And these are controlled groups that really the only difference was one had opioids, the other so it was a little hard for some people to swallow that the opioid group had significantly higher pain levels than the opioid free group, but it's because of this: it's opioid-induced hyperalgesia. And so if you can if you can eliminate the early doses of opioids, and you can do alternatives, and there's been really good data lately on medrol dose pack for elective surgery. That may be the answer for us, and it's not having it's not hard to prevent patients from taking the opioids at day two or three, if you can just eliminate the opioids in the first six to 12 hours. Yes, um, uh, to follow on the next methadone, uh, there's a study at, at Aquas this year looking at uh, continued doses of dexamethasone, uh, statistically significantly reducing the opioid So I, I think there, uh, you, you try to avoid that. I think, I, I tell them that the four nurses up here know Three T's, Tylenol, uh, Tramadol, Toradol. And the Tramadol, um, specifically, if you have to use something because it doesn't have quite as 
decided to bring back to uh, in, in the northern woods. So it's a, a, it's a strategy that works really well for tunnel joints. Go back one, one second to your comment on, on, on the dexamethasone versus methyl dose pack, because I think there's a big difference there. The dexamethasone is so quickly in and out of your system that I can see that that would have very little effect on postoperative you know, yeah. suppression of an infection. But that raw dose pack, that's pretty long acting and pretty powerful. I'll be pretty worried about um, surgical infection in that scenario. How, how, do you, how do you reconcile that? Yeah, I, I have not started using a Medrol dose pack, but it actually won the Nero Award for uh, shoulder research last year for using it in the uh, elective shoulder arthroplasty population beginning immediately after surgery for a five day course uh, with a very large number of patients with no, uh, no downside. They didn't find any complications. Yeah. Yeah. In the meta analysis that we did uh, looking at uh, at steroid use, it, it included both dexamethasone as well as multiple other steroid uses. There was no increase in the actual emissions. So five day taper seems to be reasonable in elective okay. surgery right now. Uh, <clears throat> two things. Um, you see the term hypersensitivity and hyperalgesia used intermittently. Um, I would strongly recommend use the term hyperalgesia when you're talking to patients and you say, well, they're not going to understand that word. Why would you say algesia? They do understand the word sensitive. And if you tell them they're too sensitive, it will show up in your Google review. It's like a, it's like an argument with a family member. The, the 20 minute conversation will boil down to one word. So <clears throat> it's better to use a word that's very scientific and then explain it because there really are very good basic science studies. You showed some of the road, Rodent studies are provided and go into the details of how they do those things. It's, it's a little bit hard to swallow to a certain yeah. extent. But um, the other thing I'll tell you is that the, one of the challenges we have is people come in on opioids. They come in on chronic opioids, on sometimes high dose opioids. And what are the strategies for tapering those? Um, we're working on something right now uh, where we're going to be able to, two things are in the pipeline right now. One is that basically um, handouts to actually coach clinicians into how to do those opioid tapers. Beth Arnold is a pain researcher out of uh, San Francisco who actually showed that patients can actually taper themselves as well as well as, as they can under the guidance of a physician. And so just some information for them and for clinicians for how to taper someone that comes in on a chronic opioid, mm -hmm. because that's a lot what we see um, coming in our doors. And then the other thing is we're kind of working with the, with the preoperative clinic um, to see if that's a role that's, that they can take on to a certain extent. Um, but that will require um, it will require having potentially even a plus up in their PAs and, and some training on, on how to taper opioids um, for preoperative patients. That's good. And I, I think the issue we see in trauma too, I mean, they get slugged in the ER before they get upstairs, you know, and that, I, I'm not sure where, you know, or how we start to educate that level or where we change there, but that, that's another hurdle I'm you know, thinking about. It's, it's easy when we see elective patients or an arthroscopy and we can tell them all these things or in the joints clinic, but it's, it's a totally different story when it's, when it's a polytrauma or, you know, someone that, you know, gets touched before, you know, before you get there, they're already, you know, been on opioids for 24 hours plus. So, yeah. Great discussion. Thanks.